Hi, I'm Connor Kelly O'Brien. I am an actor, writer, and I am the co-founder and executive director of the Scranton Fringe Festival. I'm here with my friend and colleague, Dan Kimbrough, who is a content creator and the proprietor, CEO, and all around everything of Park Multimedia. How you doing, Dan? I'm good. Yourself? Good. Was that a pretty apt description of your title? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right on. So you've had Park Multimedia since 2007, correct? Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about what does Park Multimedia do? How did you get started? What are you focusing on? Uh, yeah, so 2007, um, I had I was in, living in Michigan. Um, I don't know if I was employed yet or not, because I moved back to Michigan to freelance. And so I was working with a friend of mine doing some weddings and other videos um, and wanted to do more than just wedding videos. And so I decided to start my own production company. Um, eventually got a job working in mobile media, um, working on cell phones. And so it was always a side gig. And then when I moved here in 2000. Eight, um, I started teaching at Misericordia, so it was always something I did on the side for extra money, um, also to keep sort of my foot in the game, teaching media and not sort of doing it would have been a weird, weird disconnect, mm -hmm. and so I was actively doing the things I was teaching my students, so that with an, in class, the book may say one thing, but here's the real world. So when you say to, to keep engaged mm -hmm. in contact, you mean like so that way you knew what was happening in the real industry. Exactly, exactly. Gotcha. And so there's often, you know, you get a textbook, specifically if you're teaching media, that, you know, by the time a textbook is written to publication, two or three years can pass. And in media, especially nowadays, two or three years, the whole world changes. Really? Yeah. And so just think about advances in Facebook and Instagram and all these things. And if I'm teaching students to create media for social, for social media, mm -hmm. three years ago is a completely different landscape. Mm -hmm. So having the company allowed me to sort of keep abreast of what was going Going on. If you don't have a specific, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Do you have an example of something that maybe in the past couple of years has, what's been like the fastest notable turnaround or development in the industry that you've had to like literally in real time like tell your students like I'm looking into this and then come back a couple weeks or a month or two later? Uh, honestly, the, the use of video in almost all of the platforms. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to look at Instagram, originally it was a 10 second video, it was a 15 second video, it always had to be vertical, and then they allowed you to do widescreen, and so keeping up with how each of those formats changes over time, mm -hmm. because you can say, for you know, videographers, we love to shoot widescreen, that's the way, your eyes are set wide, that's the way it's supposed to look. Well, with vertical video, how do you teach something that for years wasn't supposed to be taught? That's mm -hmm. not how you do things, and so learning to do it and then turn around and teach it the next day. It must be interesting to be an expert in a profession that is so professional and so technical and so specific, but yet is so common for the, like the, like the every average person mm -hmm. has a cell phone, has Instagram. Yep. Anyone under the age of 21 is using videos mm -hmm. more than ever before. Right. So it must be really, it must be, especially as a teacher of college, I bet you have students a lot of the times come in and it must be a weird balance of they're probably so apt in the basic practical, mm -hmm. but I bet you there's some habits that you probably need to right. weed out. And so, yeah, and so um, that was one of the, the weird things. I'm not, still, I'm not teaching anymore, but when mm -hmm. I was, that was one of the weird things was that students would come in my first year, 2008, and they had never used a camera. And when you're talking video, it was a camera. Mm -hmm. By the time 2012, 13 rolled around, everyone had a cell phone and they were shooting videos and they understood framing, they understood that light needs to be in front of your subject, not behind them so they're not silhouettes. From watching horrible YouTube videos, they knew audio was a thing that was important, but they didn't know how to put a professional video together. Mm. But they knew how to put a video together, so they're like, well, why do I need to take video one? Like, I know how to make a video. Right. And it's like, well, you do, but it looks like crap. I have Snapchat. <laughs> Exa <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I hate Snapchat. Oh, um, thank you. I don't understand. <laughs> It. it is the first thing that's ever made me feel old. It was the first thing I told someone. It, I, I, it was on my 26th birthday, and it was the moment I realized that I'm closer to 30 than I was to 20. Because anything else, I still I can I can master. Right. I didn't get Snapchat. I don't know why we have it. I don't know. I don't know what the purpose of it is. I don't. Yeah. No. I agree. I agree. It's it's useful once you get into it and you know what you're doing. But I just it's my, one of my least favorite platforms of all time. So if you're a yeah. big Snapchat user audience, <laughs> sorry. Comment below why. <laughs> um, so, uh, what is your favorite platform? Um, right now, it's definitely Instagram. Um, I just, the mix between photo and video, I like IGTV. Um, now that you can actually turn your phone and it'll turn the video the way it's supposed to be seen. Um, I just think it has the least amount of clutter. Um, while it's owned by Facebook, Facebook is just turned into the everyday yelling ground and it's just a public forum for people to scream at each other. And so, yeah. Instagram is still very centric on the visuals and less about the dialogue. Not that the dialogue is bad, but it's just hard to sort of keep up with all of that every day. 
Right. And so I just like the, a platform that's being used as a platform um, that it's meant to be. And so TikTok is, I need to dive into, but that may be an, another good one as well, but I don't know yet. I just uh, created a TikTok profile for the festival, uh-huh. which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and uh, it, it, was, it amazed me how quickly you can get views on the content Mm -hmm. of that platform, but yet it has not translated into really followers. Right. And I find that an interesting, every platform's a little different. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you are currently no longer teaching. When did you, when did you stop teaching? Uh, That would have been June, May, June of uh, 2018. So, so I'm assuming it's so you could focus full time on yep, your yep. own career. And, and so, yep, I went full time with Park Multimedia at that point in time, um, and still freelance and do things with different companies here and there mm-hmm. to help pay the bills. But um, I'd gotten to a point teaching that the things that I was doing were moving too fast for the university, and things that I wanted to do and wanted to grow. We had just gotten into live streaming, um, and it was something that I wanted to do for years, and finally convinced the university. But where it needed to go and how it was going to make it function, it just it was going to take too long to do it. And then again with with social media and everything changing at a rapid rate, it for me at least it was becoming a chore to teach these things, realizing that by the time they use them, it may completely be null and void. Mm-hmm. And keeping up with that speed and all of that, it was just hard energy-wise. Um, and it was a small department I was putting in a lot of hours, and so I've got a son, I've got other outside interests, and so I just I sort of wanted my life back. So, gotcha. Yeah. Um, I wanted to touch on something a little sillier, real quick. Mm-hmm. You mentioned earlier that. At the start of your own career and your own company, you did a lot of wedding video, mm-hmm, which I mm-hmm. assume a lot of people, that's yep. probably a major mm-hmm. industry. Have you ever, what's the, without specifics, what is the craziest experience you've seen as a wedding uh, I'll videographer? Give you, I can give you extreme specifics. Go for it. A three-day Hindu wedding. Okay. When we were in Michigan, uh, elephants and all, like we, wow. yeah, we, where were we at? I was living in Lansing with the, my buddy who did the, it was his company's wedding, um, but they wanted to do this Hindu wedding, and so we learned all about it. And um, like, the, there's a seven rotations around the altar that they have to do at one point in time. That sounds but fascinating. It, it was a, it was a glorious thing, but it was three days. Like the entire family came from everywhere, and so like it was they were it was not on vacation, but they didn't see each other because of where they were all located. So it was this three day event, um, and like when they kept joking about you know the horses and the elephants when they arrive and. We thought they were joking and like, no, no, they flew in animals and it was, yeah, it was, it was a crazy, crazy wedding. Um, I think that one and then I did another one where there was an actual, it was for show, but the actual bartering between the families for the dowry of the woman, like sitting in a room and seeing these two families go back and forth over the value of a woman. And it was for show, like it was part of the cultural history, but at the same time it was happening and you're just like. Dude, I don't. I don't know it. how to. I don't know how to read this. <laughs> right, like the whole time. I'm just, what? Okay. okay. So, yeah, it was. It was really interesting. So I've seen a lot of crazy things with weddings. So those. That's. So the the first one is kind of a beautiful, right, right. unique situation. The second <laughs> one's a little weird. Have you ever experienced like true pandemonium and just uh, true raw emotional revelations at the altar? No, no. Oh, I've lucked out. I've never had a bridezilla. Um, I've never had anyone change their mind. At the or a last groomzilla. Minute. Or a groomzilla. This is very true. Um, I've never had a groomzilla. Um, mine, my goal as a wedding videographer, and I still do weddings, um, is to try to make the day go as smooth as possible. Mm-hmm. And so, like, yes, I have a camera half the day, but the majority of the time, like, bride and groom never get a chance to eat throughout the day. So, like, I will bring them food right after they do That's the vow. But just the little things so that those things don't happen. So it doesn't escalate because it's a stressful day. So it can escalate quickly. Mm-hmm. And so if you're good at working weddings, you recognize those things mm-hmm. and de-escalate them before they happen. Is that a piece of advice you would give to any videographer, photographers, if they're, if they're going to be doing oh, yeah. weddings? Oh, in, in, the, in any industry, if you have a camera, um, I forgot who said it at one conference, I said, but if you're, if you're a cinematographer or a DP, you are the psychologist on set. Because in a weird way, you're detached from everything because you're behind the camera, literally behind the camera while everyone else is out doing things. Mm-hmm. But it gives you a chance to always see what's happening, mm-hmm. and you can spot when trouble's gonna happen. Dan, I don't know what you're talking about. I think it's so, I think it's so, I think it's so normal to be on a camera. I think, I think that it's so just natural and commonplace. Yeah, no, no it's not. Okay. <laughs> you're absolutely yeah. right. So let's jump back a little bit. Mm-hmm. What, what made you wanna be behind the camera in the first place? Um, I have no clue, actually. Well, it was a mistake, honestly. Um, <laughs> 
I started in radio. Um, I was an athlete, hurt myself um, when I played college, and the radio station needed someone to help broadcast the games. What did and you I play in college? Football. I played football. Uh, and so I was like, all right, I can go. I'll try out to broadcast the football games. And ended up running the radio station within two years and was the station manager um, and had a complete audio background. I had taken video courses, but my background was in audio production. Um, and I did an internship at a TV station just running camera and had been in a control room. So I understood it, had never done it. And when I applied for grad school, I applied for an audio graduate assistantship and another person applied for the video one. And somehow the lines got crossed and I got the video assistantship and he got the audio one. And I was like, it's free grad school, I'll figure it out. And and where did you go to grad uh, Central Michigan University. Um, and so since then, they've uh, required a demo reel. Um, <laughs> it was a slight mistake, but it worked in the long run. I knew enough about video, and I'm a quick enough learner that it worked out that I was able to sort of do the assistantship, um, work in the classroom, and do all the other things that were needed. And then I fell in love with video. And so um, I do podcasting now, which is sort of a throwback to radio, but I do enjoy video. So I was, I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to talk about podcasting. I know how into it you are and how good you are at the production of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not going to bore everybody. I think anyone who's seeing this already knows what a podcast is. Right, right, I right. love when interviews are like, what's a podcast? <laughs> it's that thing that's been around for 15 years. Maybe not 15 years. Well, eh, no, about 15, 15 years. 15 yeah, yeah. years, yeah. yeah. What, um, why, though, do you think podcasts have just, to the point of beyond cliche, taken off? Uh, um, low barrier to entry. They are of all media, the easiest to produce. I mean, we've got lights, microphones, cameras everywhere. Like, this is an entire setup. You need two two microphones. Not even two microphones. You need a cell phone and hit record. And that can be a podcast. It may not be the world's greatest audio quality, but it's the lowest barrier to entry to start telling a story or giving information out there. Uh, There's one particular podcast I wanted to mention, Mm -hmm. which is the one that your son recently (laughs) has. I'm a big fan. You've listened to the two episodes? I've so listened to the two episodes. That's hilarious. I demand more content. <laughs> the third one's coming. <laughs> Tell people what the name of the podcast is, and please remind us how old its creator is. Uh, it's called The Luca Podcast, and he is eight years old. He'll be nine in March. <laughs> and what, is this just, he wanted to do what dad does, or? Um, a lot of times he wants to do what dad does, and so that's what we'll end up doing. But he also, he because I had to work in media, the equipment is always laying around, and he's sort of used to it. Um, and he, he has a YouTube channel, but again, the lights and everything, like, he gets tired of waiting for me to set it all up. Whereas with the podcast, it's literally like, all right, here's the recorder, hold your microphone, go. And we can just sort of start going, and so it's it's a lot less stressful on him, mm-hmm. um, and he just likes to talk. So I was going to say, <laughs> what is uh, what do I have to look forward to content wise in the third episode? Uh, he does a review of the uh, Rise of Skywalker. So, oh yeah. wow. <laughs> Is he going to rip it apart? Uh, no, he, that's the problem with him, though, is that he lo- everything he sees is his favorite thing. So that was his favorite Star Wars thing, and then he saw The Mandalorian, and that was his favorite Star Wars thing, and so... Let him be... Oh, yeah, and it's, it's, it's adorable that he loves everything, and for his generation to grow up with, like, the Marvel and Star Wars and all these things sort of being what they are now, mm-hmm. he's eating it up right now, so yeah. That's awesome, yeah. and he's a lovely, lovely he's young man. He's a crazy young man, but lovely. <laughs> I only see him in small bursts, so I don't... Anyone who knows him calls him a 43-year-old, 8-year-old, so... (laughs) That's a very accurate description. Um, Great. So uh, what are some of your favorite podcasts beyond The Luca Show? What are some of your favorite podcasts? Um, The big one I'm listening to right now is called uh, The Ground Up. And it's a former, well, not former, he still is. He's a videographer and filmmaker. Um, He did the documentary The Minimalist that's on um, YouTube. And he started a podcast talking with people in the industry, different industries, about how they got started. Mm-hmm. And so hearing, you know, the struggles and all these things that creatives went through to create their product or whatever they do now, but walking through that journey. And so for me, when I first started listening to it, leaving teaching, a profession where I was well-paid, I had a career, I could do it as long as I wanted to, and now starting my own business, st- literally sort of starting over from the ground up. It was, it's really interesting, um, and I like it a lot. And then This American Life, but I've been listening to NPR for years, but that's one of my favorite ones. So. What about... <clears throat> Okay, two questions. Mm-hmm. First question, when you're looking at a podcast, it crosses your path mm-hmm. and you're considering giving it a shot. What will stand out to you or what will be like a red flag, not my, not my time? Um, the red flag is if they're pushing a product or trying to get you in the long run to buy into an ideology. 
Whereas what makes me want to listen is if it's just people talking about their lives and being authentic and open. And so if the end goal is I need to buy a product or you have a master class that 18 episodes in you're going to try to sell me on mm -hmm. or I need to adopt a certain ideology, I don't, I don't want to hear it. Like, why waste my time with that? But if it's really just authentic storytelling and hearing about people's lives, um, like I don't do the, tr the true crime ones and those like the where they're sort of scripted like I just want to hear people talk and be authentic and sort of hear about their lives and their journey. Mm -hmm. And jumping back a little bit to that first podcast mm -hmm. you mentioned, what was the name of it the again? The Ground Up. The Ground Up. Who are some filmmakers, photographers, or content creators that re that really inspire uh, you? That oh, inspire me in general? Mm -hmm. um, or have once upon oh, yeah. a time? Um, I'm a big, I love Robert Rodriguez, um, Spy Kids, um, uh, El Mariachi, he works a lot with Quentin Tarantino. Um, he was one of the first people to sort of get into digital when it was still that sort of back, struggle back and forth between film and digital. And the idea that if you sort of use the tools that are given to you, you can create whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And so instead of trying to fight and stay true to what we did in the past, let's see what we can actually achieve in the future and sort of using these tools. So I love him. Um, I'm a big Spike Lee fan, uh, as controversial as he can be. He's just done a lot for African-American storytelling in general, mm -hmm. um, but I'm a documentary buff, and so his work, um, like When the Levees Broke, um, mm -hmm. was a great one looking at Katrina when that happened. Um, and I've seen him speak a few times, and just the way, the lens in which he tells stories is one that we don't see a lot of, and you'd think even now we'd have more of it, but it's still not, and so um, those are probably my biggest two influences. With that being, <clears throat> on touching on that, and this is probably such a stupid question to ask, it's a, it's a, it's a silly question, but there there is some interesting depths in it that I want to question you on mm -hmm. or find out about. What is it? What is the, What are the challenges of being an African American filmmaker and content creator in 2020, specifically maybe in Northeast Pennsylvania or <laughs> or bigger picture, right. whatever speaks to um. you. I think it's the same struggle that any any person who's on a you know that minority checklist of different things like mm -hmm. going into it you're expected to sort of be able to do double the work like everything that I do, I can't make a mistake mm -hmm. because if I do then I'm it's not that I made a mistake because something else went wrong it's that I'm not professional enough mm -hmm. and so I have to always sort of be mindful but even when I was teaching and every other job that I've had that's always been one of those things that no matter what the bar is, I've got to sort of double it because my setback will move me really far back. It won't sort of move me back to ground zero. And so um, I think that's one of them. And then um, I've lived all over the country, moved around a lot. And so one of the things has always been understanding the spaces that I'm in. So being African-American and being a content creator and working in media, when I'm working in bigger sets, it's never been an issue. Like I used to work with ESPN um, and like that was no big deal. Like put an ESPN jacket on, no one cares what you look like. But then going into small mom and pop shops and trying to sort of cold sell someone or people I've emailed back and forth with and then walk in with a meeting and they see me and they're like, oh, mm. like they had no clue. My name's Dan, you know, I can be professional on the phone and in an email. So like they assume, well, he's professional, his name is Dan, there's no apostrophes, da 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 da, must be a white person. And they walk in the room and they see me and there's sometimes they, sort of step back a little bit and then it's like well but we've made it this far why now I love that Dan <laughs> I love that Dan it's a default yeah. Caucasian name oh yeah it is it is it totally Bob I had, I had a client Dan. who was black who when he met me in person was shocked that I was black wow yeah and like he walked in we were I forgot where we met but he walked in and I'd seen him numerous times I created his website I had seen his photo and he didn't speak to me and it took me a while I was like he has no clue who I am. Mm -hmm. And so I introduced myself. He was, you're black? We've talked on the phone. He goes, yeah, but you sound white. I just assumed you were a white guy. Interesting. Yeah, and so. <laughs> Interesting. Do you, do, you, do you face that often? Um, Not as much in sort of the digital world now with LinkedIn and, and my uh, because we have the web page. To... Hey, right, and so like my face is out there. So um, it's not as bad now, but before, all of those things, it was usually when folks would meet me if they had only spoken or emailed with me, it with, was a shock. Well, obviously, I think we would all, I think we would both agree that the power of storytelling is to find the commonalities mm -hmm. and, the, mm -hmm. and the universality. But I, I think that it goes without saying that it's n at least maybe, let's say, our lifetimes. It's never going to stop being important that we view stories through the lens of those that have totally different world experiences oh, oh, and, and, and world views. How, how important... I'm going to word this question very carefully. <laughs> no, because I, I know what I'm trying to say. How, let's, I'm going to yeah, put it like, how frustrated do you get when you see a certain story, certain narrative, true or fic fictional or real, mm -hmm. being told through, let's be very real, a white 
American lens. Um, when it when it would have been when the story was really would have been more benefited by an authentic. I'm I've got I, I'm really good at weeding out things, and so I don't. It's rare that I would watch something that comes from that. Like I, I have mm-hmm. I have a group of individuals who you know on Facebook and Twitter and things that were like if they recommend something, I'm much more likely to go mm-hmm. and pay attention to it than if the general public. You is see the it. smoke before you get to exactly. the fire. Exactly. Gotcha. And so, and I think that one thing to remember is though that almost everything is going to be flawed. Like if I as an African American am telling a story. Even if I'm telling the story from my lens, I'm not a black woman. Right. And so, like, I think that whenever you're storytelling, your writer's room or your creative cohort has to be made up of the people that you're trying to portray. Right. Otherwise, you're not going to be authentic. But not only does it need to be made up of them, they have to have equal say. So, like, if I'm creating something and I'm going to use a trans black character... I'm not writing the character. Like, I can say, this is the arc I want them to go on. A, is that okay? B, you fill in the rest. Right. Because I don't understand that, but right. I know that I want that character in the overall story. Right. The best, in my opinion, like, the best stories, theater, plays, whatever you want to call it, are stories that are so specific. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then when you do the specific well, like you just said, the arcs are universal. Right. You know, we all want the same things. We mm-hmm. want love, unless we're crazy right you know but it's and we all have these objectives but yeah but the, the specificity of it is so important exactly i also I, I i appreciate what you said too that you know we can't just generalize even even within marginalized groups we can't even just wash and generalize that exactly i got brought into a writer's room recently in new york mm-hmm. um which is so absurd that this happened in new york and they wanted more they wanted more queer perspectives which was Fat, fantastic and great, but then the, the the perspectives they were looking for, I had like you know I and this is not me patting myself mm-hmm. on the back. It was just so glaringly obvious to me and anyone else, most people in the room. I had to sit there and go like, I'm a white cisgendered, <laughs> able-bodied man from who grew up in Northeast Pennsylvania. I mean like I said, I'm happy to be a writer. Right. I can write characters. I can create dialogue. I can't tell you what this right. trans person from Iowa's experience was. Exactly. Um, and I, I, and I do think there's a balance to that, yeah. and, and it's how you communicate that. I don't want to keep going down this path. How do you, wh- what are your thoughts on mainstream? We talked a lot about like independent, right. more like content driven, but when we're talking about, you know, we have the Oscars coming up soon, yeah. depending on when this airs mm-hmm. and you're viewing it. What are your thoughts on, you know, there was, there, there was a push for more diversity and then it seems that we seem to have moved on and forgotten about that entire <laughs> campaign and issue. And what are your thoughts on that? Or should that, yeah. e- should that even be what we're focusing on? Um, I, think, I think the focus should always be there that we need more, more diverse, diversity in storytelling. But I think that what gets lost in awards races is that, like, best film, the best picture goes to a producer. A producer's job is to sort of coordinate a set overall. And so they, and they're usually the one who's doing the hiring and the firing and the picking of everyone. And so I feel like best film can be about any story at once, but let's look at who's being hired and fired, who's behind the scenes as well. Mm-hmm. And so I think that while the writer's room is extremely important, like I want to see that there are more women behind the camera mm-hmm. because when something is written that steps out of bounds, the writer's room may have, it's part of, the, it's integral to the story. This is what they want. It's a diverse room but they haven't seen it acted out. They don't mm-hmm. realize that uh, if we do this... It's you... going to read like blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and yeah. so I think that not just having the room or the actors being diverse, but like you need to build diverse sets. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what's really missing. And when we get to a point where someone can walk into a, a set and feel comfortable because someone there represents part of their identity and that makes them feel safe, I think that then we sort of get to this point of parody where things... It doesn't matter that the movie is about rural white people in Iowa. Mm-hmm. That's fine, but let's look behind the scenes. 35% of the set, the people creating it, mm-hmm. were people of different backgrounds, and there was a difference there, because I think that the rural white story in Iowa is still a story that can be told. Mm-hmm. And if the story doesn't have a black person in town, that's fine. But that doesn't mean that there's no black people on set. That doesn't right. mean that there's not a queer person somewhere in a role right. of importance, not just doing craft services. I was going to say, it's just like you said, it's not just about checking off a box like, she's over there. 
It's right. about saying, like, does she have a voice that, we, exactly. that, we're, that we're listening to? Exactly. Um, speaking of work and jumping back to the mm -hmm. Spike Lee conversation, you mentioned his work in documentary mm -hmm. subjects. You have a documentary that you've been Hopefully. in. That, you, that you're <laughs> yeah. in process of. Yeah, yeah. And it's subject on the 2011 flooding of the mm -hmm. Wilkes-Barre area. Yep. And so, yeah, I uh, worked with a friend of mine, Kristen Gatos, who works at the Citizen's Voice. We went out the, right when the flood was happening. And so we shot a lot of video. And we were going to try to do a documentary immediately. But um, my son was born that year. And just things were crazy. And so I didn't get around to it. But sort of looking back, I have all this footage. And I've got ride-along footage and talking with police officers and interviews and everything. And I sort of want to do uh, a look back and sort of see 10 Ten years later, what have we learned? Like the people who I interviewed, are they still here? Are they still worried about flooding? Um, I think it's one of those when we look at climate change in general and sort of bringing that narrative home. Like flooding in this area is a big deal. And what was it? Agnes was supposed to be the once every fifty years flood, and then in two thousand eleven, another flood of that magnitude. Mm. And right, the idea that you know there's and being able to tie that into the sort of this bigger picture. Mm -hmm. So it's about NEPA and the river and that worry. But then what does that say on another? level when we sort of look at climate change and sort of the global issue yeah. of is this an issue, is that what's sort of playing into this? And we all know it is, but yes. <laughs> sort of, I know, short, short documentary, um, but telling that story. And so I'm hoping to have the time to sort of weed that out and sort of get to that this year. That's so. fascinating. And you're hoping to accomplish that in 2020? Yes. Yeah. yeah so that I can release it in 2000, 20, uh, 2021. So 10 years later. Fabulous. So. And what are your, what would be your objectives for it? Festivals? Uh, yeah. Festivals and, and not even a festival track, just um, at a local level to get people sort of looking at it and talking about it. Um, I think festivals are great, but something of that nature, I think we can, at a local level, you can find ways of sort of working with uh, politicians and sort of getting their ear and sort of letting it screen that way. Um, I did one, we did two at Misericordia on voting rights, and mm -hmm. we were able to get voting locations changed in Luzerne County wow. that weren't accessible because, they, and which is horrible because if they're not accessible on voting day, they're also not accessible the rest of the year to individuals. Right. And so, and then we found that like there was voting equipment that had been when donated. When you say accessible. I'm talking about being able to literally get in. Mobility. The, the, mobility, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and so, because that's the thing is that ideally voting, everyone should be able to go to vote. Mm -hmm. And everyone, oh, well you can write in stuff. Well yeah, but that's separate but equal. And we've done that before. Let's not go down that road again. And so, uh, and at one point we found that there was a basement that had $66,000 worth of um, equipment to, to make places accessible that were collecting dust. Right, and so while documentaries and festival circuits are great, if I can make a change or help someone, I would That's rather awesome. go that route than a festival circuit, so. But speaking of festivals. Right. <laughs> There's one that I know you might want to talk about. There's one in particular. So for those who don't know, if I haven't mentioned it 30 million times, um, I'm the co-founder and executive director of the Scranton Fringe Festival. It's a nonprofit performing arts festival that is approaching its sixth year in downtown Scranton. In 2019, we had about 7,000 in attendance, and we had over 100 performances of theater, dance, comedy, music from an open application process, literally from all across the world. Dan, uh, mm -hmm. you have been our tech director yes, for the last two years. This will be your third yep. year, um, and your position in that is to ensure the overall lighting, sound, projection, mm -hmm. Elements are all in place. You do everything above and beyond that, I thank you as well that. as your. It's <laughs> just fact. Um, our applications for the 2020 festival, which is September 24th through October 6th, open on February 9th. Mm -hmm. um, you can apply for free. Anyone can at scrantonfringe.org/apply. That's scrantonfringe.org/apply. Um, last time I'll do that. <laughs> so, really quickly, what would you say? What would have been your experiences at the Scranton Fringe? Um, good, bad, the ugly, mm -hmm. you know, constructive, positive, all that stuff. And what would you say to artists that are considering applying? Um, it was, I attended Fringe before, I'd been to one or two shows. Um, so from that side, switching to being the tech director, it was a humongous switch, sort of yeah. coming behind the scenes and sort of seeing how it was all done. But I think it's a great experience. It's been a great experience so far. Mm -hmm. um, I love tech. I love, I love, I love allowing creators to create. And so being able to make sure that the lighting is set and sound works and all those little things, um, like I'm not going to get on stage and ever perform. Like that's not what I do. We'll see. <laughs> I know I know an eight-year-old who might want to, but I won't be doing it. Um, but being able to sort of do the behind the scenes work and sort of help that happen has been wonderful. Um, it's a little crazy though, you know, eight venues at one point in time and sort of making sure they're all running and running back and forth across Scranton. And um, it's been it's been an experience of nothing else. Um, but I think it's a positive experience. I think that it speaks volumes that you get submissions from all around the world mm -hmm. and that the Fringe network in general, like the national or international network of Fringe, 
exist, I think, as a very positive thing for mm -hmm. shows that are sort of outside the lines or need a testing ground or just are trying to figure out if what they have is good. So I mm -hmm. think that's an amazing thing. Um, and that it happens here locally, mm -hmm. I think it's a really big benefit. Um, and I've enjoyed it. I've really enjoyed it a lot. So Awesome. <clears throat> so you would definitely encourage artists to get oh, their a heartbeat, yeah. then. And, and even if it's just getting, the, even if it doesn't get accepted, I think applying for it and going through that process, if you have a creative work, even if it gets just uh, gets uh, thrown out, that's fine. You've done that at least. Like you've right. gotten through that process, so I think that's really good. I totally um, agree. And again, some of the shows we've seen have not been in their prime, mm -hmm. but they were able to use that feedback to make the show better. Right. And then from there it grew. And so I would definitely say if you've got something that's 75% ready, apply and let's see what happens. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, at the end of the show, we like to ask a round of rapid fire questions. Mm -hmm. Silly, but to, but it's kind of to delve into your personal uh, personality and let us know you a little bit better. So if I'm asking you a question that you either don't have an answer to or don't want to answer, just say pass. All right. Ready? Yep. You wake up in the morning, coffee or tea? Coffee. What's your favorite color? Orange. What book have you been reading lately? Uh, I read a lot of articles, not books. Okay. What what's, what are some art, what are some uh, publications that you like to read? Uh, I read a lot about content marketing and podcasting. I'm boring. Deeply fascinating. <laughs> uh, what's one of your what's a, what's a, what, one of your go to favorite meals dishes? Uh, Gumbo. What's one of your favorite movies? Uh, oh God, that's a horrible question. Um, <laughs> favorite movies? Mm -hmm. It's an old movie no one's ever seen called Habit as a Playground. What is a movie in the last, let's say, 20 years mm -hmm. or so, or whatever, that you think is vastly overrated? Oh, Lord. Yeah. Uh, 20 years? Oof. Or in general. When, when, when I say, what's a big, you think Citizen Kane is overrated? Vastly overrated. <laughs> Viewers, show me your rage Most below. America classic cinema, overrated. We can have an entire episode on that, and we're going to. I think that's a fascinating subject matter. If you could say one thing to aspiring content creators, filmmakers, mm -hmm. you know, young people who want to get into production, what would you say? Or not young people. Um, I think anyone. Um, given today's tool, everyone has a TV station and a radio station in their pocket. If you've got an idea, do it. If it fails miserably, who cares? I, I tried. Love, I love that. Thank you. Thank you <laughs> yeah. for being here, Dan. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. Uh, so. This has been Connor Kelly O'Brien speaking with Dan Kimbrough. If they want to learn more about Dan, you can go to parkmultimedia.com. Parkmultimedia.com. Thank you. You can also find it on social media. Thanks so much, Dan. Thank you.